Thank you, Chris and Jeremy, choir and orchestra. <clears throat> amazing, amazing music today and how we celebrate that together. If I ask you this morning what day it is, you could give me one of two answers. The easy church answer is what? Today is? Okay, the, the non-church answer is that today is? April Fool's Day. How about that? Easter and April Fool's Day on the same day. Do you know that hasn't happened in my lifetime? The last time April Fool's Day and Easter coincided, it was 1956. And it won't happen again until 2029. Now, I'm planning on sticking around for the next one. But you know, there's something about the collision of those two things that's worth pondering this morning. When I think about April Fool's Day, uh, without question, my mind immediately goes back to a dear saint named Peggy Seymour. Now, Peggy, the fr I'd only been pastor of the church for a few, few months, and she called me and said, uh, would you come join me and my husband for lunch at the little uh, bistro there in town? I said, sure, I'm always up for lunch. By the way, folks, I'm always up for lunch. So we, we went down there, and I, I, I sat 12 o'clock came, five minutes went, ten minutes went, and just when I was debating whether I should go ahead and order or just get up and go back to the office, the waitress came by with a phone and said, are you Glenn Money? I said, yes, handed me the phone, and there was that voice on the other end, April Fool's. <laughs> Do not try this at home, okay? And then it started something. For every year, there was, there was a call, or there was some request you know and after seven or eight years I caught on I, and, uh, and so I just kind of got to know and I, listen I'm not going to I'm not going to respond I'm not going to pay attention I'm not going to answer the phone I told her one year you better not die on April Fool's Day because I ain't coming to check on you because I'm not going to believe it <clears throat> and so we, we went a few years without me uh, I fall and pray to that and April Fool's fell on Sunday eight years ago and I'm walking down the hall and I see Peggy Peggy says Glenn do you know what day it is I said I sure do it's it's this April Fool's Day and you're you're not gonna fool me and so I went in and I was getting ready to uh, to preach and I went up and I took a sip of water went to take a sip of water only to find out that sister Peggy had scotch taped my glass to the pulpit she got me she got me there's something about the coinciding of these two days that seem about as far apart as they can be that somehow makes sense <clears throat> pardon me it somehow makes sense because we really do when we break it all down have to be foolish enough to believe. It's easy for us as people of faith to point to those who may not and say, that's foolishness. Scripture gives us plenty of words to that end. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. We've, we've heard many things like that that makes it easy for us to cast judgment. But I remember in 1 Corinthians, the first chapter, verse 21, Paul writes that God was pleased by the foolishness of what was preached to save those who believed somehow when we believe that which seems impossible is possible that which seems incredible suddenly becomes credible because of how we receive it that which seems foolishness to us we but we would take on the great uh, with joy to be a fool for Christ there's a certain foolishness to the belief that this morning we don't need to shun and we don't need to back away from, but we ought to embrace. The question this morning is, do you believe? Are you foolish enough to believe? L.D. Johnson was a favorite pastor and preacher in my early years, very impactful and he tells a story when he was an older man. He was a grandfather, had several kids with him. They were riding. And one of his children asked him, said, Grandpa, 
do you believe in the Easter Bunny? He thought for a minute and said, well, how am I going to answer this? He said, well, I am the oldest and the wisest member of the Johnson clan. I am the pastor. I've been to seminary. I understand the origins of the various symbols of Easter, religious and non. So I could speak into that, and he began to just wax eloquent to his grandkids. And finally, one of his grandchildren said to him, Pop, shut up. All I want to know is, do you believe? And this morning, maybe that's a good question for all of us. Do we believe? The Bible gives us a lot of input and a lot of insight into that. I'd ask you to grab your Bibles and look with me to John's Gospel, chapter 20. To hear the words of this text, we heard the beginnings of the stories this morning in the readings, but let me share with you the rest of the story. Beginning with verse 19, on the evening of that first day of the week, when the disciples were together, with the doors locked for fear of the Jews, Jesus came, and he stood among them, and he said, Peace be with you. And after he said this, he, he showed them his hands and his side, and the disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. Again, Jesus said, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And with that, he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone their sins, they are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. That's an odd teaching for the moment. And then we break to the next story. A little more familiar when Jesus appears to the one that we've come to know as Doubting Thomas. Verse 14, it says, Now Thomas called Didymus, that means he was a twin, was one of the twelve, was not with the disciples when Jesus came. So the other disciples said to him, we have seen the Lord. But he said to them, unless the nail, I see the nail marks in his hands, and put my finger where the nails were, put my hand into his side, I will not believe. I'm just not going to buy that foolishness without proof. A week later, his disciples were in the house again, and Thomas this time was with them. And though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. And then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here. See my hands. Reach out your hand and put it into my side and stop doubting and believe. And Thomas said to him, My Lord and my God, and then Jesus said, because you have seen me, you have believed. But blessed are those who have not seen and yet are foolish enough to believe. Jesus did many other miracles and signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book. But these are written so that you may believe, there's that word again, that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing, you may have life in his name. This is the word of God for the people of God. Hear it, believe it, and live. Join me in a short prayer. Father, in these moments, let us hear these scriptures and these stories as if we were hearing them for the first time. And as we listen to the story of two disciples who got there first, the women who were there, the disciples to whom Jesus came, and even the doubter, may we find ourselves in our story in this story. And may we all be foolish enough to believe. That is our hope, our prayer, and our expectation. And we make it all in Jesus' name. Amen. We'd all love to have proof of the resurrection, but I hate to tell you this this morning, we don't have any. We don't have the proof that comes, there's not a DVD, uh, there's not a, 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 a seismograph that caught the, uh, the earthquake and bore witness to it. 
Even in the disciples' account, we get Jesus being put into the tomb, and then we get the empty tomb, and we really don't have a what happened in between. But we are called to believe that which we have not seen. We're called to do this in a way that says, Lord, it doesn't always make sense to me. But the proof that I have comes through my belief. Chuck Colson was a famous Watergate conspirator who in prison found Jesus. And he gave to us some of the best apologetics for the Christian faith and some of the best teachings on ethics that we had in the last 20 to 30 years. And part of what he said was this, I know that the resurrection is true. Now, how does he know? He says, I know because of Watergate. Try putting those two things together. He says, I know that because the word of the resurrection came to 12 disciples. And they endured in telling the story. They never deviated. They never denied. And for 40 years, they preached the message of the resurrected Lord. And they're... they're, they're, they're a reward for that was they were in prison, they were stoned, they were beaten, they were threatened, they were outcast. But yet for 40 years, never once changing, never once backing away, he said Watergate brought together 12 of the most powerful men in the world, and they couldn't keep alive for three weeks. There's no way that these men would keep the story alive were it not true you see there's power in that and knowing that our proof comes by our experience and that of others you see what we do have is stories that have been told and believed and told and believed and retold and believed some more until what we have is a perfect picture given to us through God's word And we have the evidence of the saints that have gone before us who are saying, I know Jesus is alive because he is alive in me. In fact, say that with me. I know Jesus is alive because he is alive in me. Say it one more time. Hold on to that thought. John's gospel gives us four takes, four different encounters along the way. The first of those were the disciples, John and Peter, and they're coming up on the the tomb. They have heard the word, and they're rushing in to see if there's anything to this uh, this great thing. And John, you got to remember this about John. John always makes himself look good. You know, John was the one who wrote about the disciple whom Jesus loved, and he's writing about himself. You know, John John had had a little ego in that. Uh, It's also kind of cool that when Peter and John are running to the tomb, John makes it a point of saying, Peter, Peter came in second in the race. I got there first. Just like a kid. But they came to the empty tomb. And they looked and they saw nothing. And they believed everything. Some people are like that. They come and, and they just intuitively embrace the faith. It, it, it makes sense. We, no, no great conversion, no great moment. They look in there and they see and they believe that the risen Lord is among us. He is no longer there, and because of that, we can have eternal life. What a special gift to be able to look and to intuitively come to faith. In a sense, it comes kind of natural. In a lot of ways, that was my story. As a child, I I never had a radical conversion later in life. I I did plenty that probably warranted it later on. But as a child, to come and say, I believe that. I know that Jesus is alive because he's alive in me. And then you get the second encounter, and that was with Mary and the women with Mary Magdalene. It says there that the disciples went back into their homes, but Mary stood outside the tomb crying. And as she wept, she bent over to look uh, into the tomb and saw two angels in white, seated where Jesus' body had been, one at the head and the other at the foot. And then they asked her, woman, why are you crying? 
So they have taken my Lord away, and I don't know where to find him. And at this, she turned around, and she saw Jesus standing there. But she didn't realize that it was Jesus. Woman, he said, why are you crying? Who is it that you're looking for? She thought he was the gardener and said, sir, if you've carried my Lord away, please tell me where you've put him, and I'll go and get him. And then Jesus says one word that changed everything. What was that word? Mary. He called her by name. There are times when we encounter the risen Lord, and he know that he knows our story. And we know that we know that he meets us right where we are. It's personal, and it's real. And it speaks to us through our own story. Maybe against the backdrop of our own sins, we hear the word calling our name and offering forgiveness. But perhaps against our own doubts, he brings the voice that calls our name so that we might have clarity. Against our griefs and our hurts, he comes in and he whispers to us our name and says, my grace is sufficient. Sometimes the word of the resurrection comes to us personally addressed in a way that says, this is for you. I remember visiting in the hospital one time with a dear older lady. She was in, in pretty rapid decline. But our, the deacons of the church had been carrying to her the DVDs of the sermons and the, the services so she could still feel connected with the church family long before the days of, uh, of Internet. And I went to see her, and I remember her saying to me, Pastor Glenn, I, I love that message last week. It had my name all over it. And all of a sudden, this, this stupid preacher swelled with just a little bit of pride saying, I'm so glad that I could preach into your life situation. I'm so glad. I didn't say that, but that's what I was thinking. I'm so glad that you recognized that and somehow appropriated it to me. She said, my name was all in that sermon last week. And as I was walking back to my car, I remembered that I had preached from 2 Timothy where Paul says, I know this faith is in you because it was in your mother Eunice and your grandmother Lois. Guess what the lady's name was? Lois. Her name was all in that passage. Well, I've yet to find a passage that calls anybody Glenn. But I do know this. There are times when the risen Lord comes to me and says, Glenn, I know what you need. I know where you're at. And he speaks my name. And if you listen carefully, he does you as well. Then we wander through and we get the coming to the disciples. That strange passage where he talks about forgiveness and says, I, 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 he shows himself. And then he says, I'll bring peace, bring peace to you. Uh, and if you forgive, they'll be forgiven. Uh, he's given them the Holy Spirit. What in the world does that cumbersome bunch of words mean? Well, if you look closely, you'll find in there all of the ordinary activity of the church. There's the giving of peace. In the liturgical tradition, you would begin a service by saying, Peace be with you. And then what would you say to the person who greets you? And also with you. The work of the church is bringing peace into chaotic lives. We find here the coming of the Holy Spirit and the recognizing of the Spirit in their lives. The baptism, we find the coming there. We, we just see the ordinary work of the church. And sometimes folks experience Christ that way. Not always, but sometimes. With what we do has meaning and purpose. And then lastly, we get to Thomas, doubting Thomas. Let's don't give him too much of a hard time because we would have doubted too. There's nothing wrong with being a healthy skeptic. Do you know anybody like that? Are, are you like that? I, I have my moments. But Thomas gets so much right later, but yet he's defined by that one moment when he says, Lord, 
Everybody can believe if you want to, but I will not believe until I see it. I got to see it to believe it. And then the miracle is not that he saw it, he did. The miracle of that passage is that Jesus came to him because he knew he needed to encounter and to see the risen Lord. This morning, know this He comes to you. See my hands, see my side. He comes to us with the word, come and believe. Not because you see it, not because you have proof, but blessed are those who have not seen and yet believe. Isn't it interesting that John gives us four stories? It's as if they all wind up in the same place, but they come into the room through separate doors. Through the door of intuitive faith, the, the door of personal connection that spoke into life, through the door of the ordinary activity of the church, and through the door of answering our deepest doubts, and then being told, Thomas, you get to see the proof, not everybody's going to see that. Blessed are those who don't see it, yet choose to believe. Heidi Newmark tells a story of a ragtag church in South Bronx. It's in the rough, poor area of New York. Some of you have been there. And her church was, uh, that she was a part of led was, was made up of folks you know, fresh out of prison. Uh, there were folks who had come in off of the street. There were people there who were uh, drug addicts and drug dealers. There were people in the church that had, had, were fighting their way, a part of way from a life of prostitution. And folks, those were the deacons in the church. But they got this wild idea that somehow they could bring the message of the gospel and the resurrection to the people of their community in some way that might be tangible, that people could see and they could believe. And so they got to thinking about, well, let's act this out. Somebody knew somebody who knew somebody who lived outside the town who had a donkey. So they hauled a donkey into New York City. Can you imagine that? That would get your attention. And all of a sudden they came behind, walking behind the donkey, waving the palms and enacting the, uh, the, the triumphal entry that we celebrated last week. And as they were getting ready to come back into the church, a funny thing happened. They, they ran into a protest. You know, New York's always protesting. You know, something's going on there. And these protesters came, and all of a sudden they just kind of came together, and they just meshed up with one another. Not knowing what else to do, they just all went into church together. And there they saw it acted out. They saw the Last Supper when the heart was breaking, and Jesus was, was betrayed. And you could hear the voices in the congregation saying, yeah, I've been treated like that. I know what that feels like. When you see the trial and somebody brought before the authorities on trumped up charges to be, uh, be proclaimed guilty and then their life taken from them, yeah, it's like that. To see the Lord put away into the tomb and to know the heartbreak, heartbreak of grief and you could hear the people saying, I, I know about that. But then it came time for the resurrection moment. And how do you show that? Well, the simple answer for that was to come one at a time. And for the people that were in the play to reenact the three women who came to the empty tomb. And to one at a time say, I know Jesus is alive because he is alive in me. And then the second one would say, I know Jesus is alive because he is alive in me. And the third one said, I know that Jesus is alive because he is alive in me. And that was the end of the script, but it wasn't the end of the play. Because one by one through the congregation, they began to say over and over and over again, I know Jesus is alive because he is alive in me. What say you to that? I know Jesus is alive because he is alive in me. Say it again. 
Say it strong enough folks can hear it out on Frontage Road. The question for us this morning is are you foolish enough to believe that? May we all be. Join me in prayer. Father, we've come together on this Easter morning to ponder the significance of an empty tomb. On the day that we were reminded of our foolishness. Lord, I want to be fool enough to believe. It's hard to absorb, it's hard to figure, it's impossible to prove. Except my own belief and our own experience. This morning, Lord, make it real for all of us as we celebrate the risen Christ who stands with us, who stands before us and begs us to believe. For it's in his name that we pray. Amen. We're going to stand together, sing together a great hymn of our faith to give us an opportunity to respond, to pray about anything on your heart, perhaps to come this morning and say, this is the day that I will believe. Perhaps to come and say, this is my church family. This is where I belong. Whatever it is, would you do so as we stand together and as we sing?